This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcasts that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode number 29. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. I can tell. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. Today we're discussing the original series episode, Man Trap. <laughs> Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? As always, I just want to remind folks, remember to like Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook, on the SQPN Facebook page. Find the episodes that are there, and uh, if you can like them, share them, comment on them. Uh, if you can retweet the episodes on Twitter... Um, that helps us get the word out to other people. It gets the bumps it up in the algorithms and all the other sort of things that uh, we have to fight against in order to get noticed in social media. But we also really love to get your feedback as well. So that that's a, a, bo a bonus uh, to that. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, please do so. Make sure you get every episode by subscribing in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app or YouTube. If you subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell to get notifications and make sure you, you get notified whenever a new episode gets posted. And then just please share the podcast with your friends. Help us grow our community uh, and reach more listeners. That's why we're doing this. Uh, Jimmy, you have a, a, an important and timely message for our listeners. Right. So uh, StarQuest has been doing a giving campaign recently. It's the first one we've done in two years. We're doing it because our funds are depleted and we need to hear from you. We made a decision a while back to uh, really embrace our charism, our calling to engage pop culture with the gospel. We created or revitalized a bunch of new podcasts, including uh, Let's Talk and Secrets of Star Trek and Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. And we need your help if we're going to continue to produce those. Uh, we're at the end of our giving campaign now. We still have uh, a long way to go. We need to uh, build more support for the future. So if you like Secrets of Star Trek, if you like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, if you like Secrets of Doctor Who and all the other wonderful podcasts we have here at StarQuest, Please, 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 time is running out for this giving campaign. Go to sqpn.com slash give and become one of our regular monthly Patreon supporters. We have some wonderful thank you gifts we'd like to send you, including ones themed around Star Trek. One of them is the autobiography of James T. Kirk. And uh, we're actually going to be doing a future episode of this podcast just on that book. So get your copy now by supporting StarQuest, and you'll be all up to speed uh, for when we do that episode, and you'll get so much more out of it, as well as getting more out of Star Trek in general. So please uh, do help us out. We, we are serious about the fact that we need your support if we're going to continue to produce these podcasts. In fact, one of the podcasts that we recently began, StarQuest Headlines, which was a daily podcast we were doing, we had to downgrade it. Uh, we had to downgrade it to a weekly status, and its future at this point is uncertain, as is the future of all our podcasts, unless we hear from you. So uh, this is, you know, the, uh, we're in the Christmas season now, broadly speaking, and it's a time when people are being generous. They're making their tax preparations for next year, so they're doing extra charitable giving right now as a way of uh, 
obtaining additional deductions next year. So please, by all means, go to sqpn.com slash give and uh, please give generously right now. Please do it while you're thinking about it before you forget. Yep. Should point out that we are a 501c3 organization and that your uh, donations are tax deductible, uh, but consult your tax professional to be sure. Uh, don't take tax advice from me. That would be a bad idea. So <laughs> the t- let's talk about this episode. This is uh, Man Trap. It's the first episode of Star Trek. Uh, the Man at- Trap. I'm sorry, The Man Trap. That's right. It's actually important to our article to add on there so i I should uh make sure i modify that in my notes but don't forget but the man trap was the first episode of star trek ever aired uh so Mm -hmm. there were two pilots made uh as we know we've already discussed the cage and uh where no man has gone before but the first episode of star trek ever to appear before a mass audience was the man trap this one and that's uh, significant it's something to think about um, yeah, this was people's the public's first exposure to the show, right? And mm-hmm. and to you know, kind of spoil my my uh, conclusion, I think it was a good one. I think it was a good exposure. This is a, this mm-hmm. as I watched it, you know, with a critical eye. This is this this has a, a pretty much everything I like about Star Trek in it. Every all the characters are fully realized, pretty much, um, and it's it's got all of the the elements that I always enjoyed. Um, so. Mm-hmm. To kind of follow up from, okay, go ahead, Jimmy. You're going to add. Well, I was I was going to say let's let's start by talking about the title because yes. this is a term we've got a lot of younger listeners, and even in when I was growing up watching Star Trek in the '70s, man trap was kind of an old fashioned term, and so mm. I would imagine there are a lot of people today who are not familiar with it. Um, it can mean a number of different things today. It's generally understood to mean human trap, just something that traps people. But that is not what it meant back in the day. It meant a woman who is on the make, the female equivalent of a Lothario, someone who, uh, some woman who is out to seduce a man and possibly also marry him, Um, Hmm. but at least seduction. And and this word has an interesting history. One of the things that, uh, one of the, uses that I'm aware of, a famous historical one, is it's actually in the play Our American Cousin, which is the play that uh, Abraham Lincoln was watching when he was assassinated by John Wilkes (laughs) Booth. And Booth, being an actor, knew the play and knew where the funny lines were, so there would where there would be lots of laughter. And he actually planned to use the laughter after this one particular line to make the assassination attempt so it would cover the sound of the gunshot and um, the laughter would. And the line is one that occurs when the title character, the American cousin, is talking to one of his British relatives who's just accused him of being uncouth because he's kind of this, you know, unpolished American in high society England. Hmm. And he says... Don't know the manners of good society, eh? Well, I guess I know enough to turn you inside out, old gal, you sockdologizing old (laughs) man-trap. And Mm. that was considered one of the funniest lines of the play, and it got a huge applause, and subsequently it's gone down in history for that. Oh, that's portentous given this uh, episode, you know, is titled (laughs) The Man Trap. (laughs) And And aired. it's (laughs) it's about a seductive woman who's killing guys. Yeah. Um, when, what was the date that Kennedy was shot? Uh, 1963, November 22nd. So this was still, th- so three years later, this is three years yeah. later, this people may have already been thinking about Lincoln. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. That's it's yeah. an interesting thought. Uh, but what we have here is a, uh, a different kind of man trap, a, uh, uh, a, an alien creature that takes the guise of, uh, he wants men for their salt. For their salt, yes. A, a salt vampire. Um, Which is a cool concept. Yes, yes. Uh, it's It sort of takes that vampire, not, it doesn't want your blood, it wants something else that seems mundane and normal uh, to us, but uh, we need, you know, we, we can't live without. Um, this is the, also the first time, this episode is the first time we see the final design for the bridge and the uniforms. Uh, you know, we had a different design 
in the second pilot as well. Um, and in the opening shot, we see Uhura seated at the navigator's console, which is interesting given yes. that we in the rest of the episode, it's clear she's a communications officer and she sits at the communications uh, console. So it's kind of uh, funny that we, we've got this odd uh, arrangement. Uh, Sulu is not yet the na uh, the helmsman. Uh, I think it's the uh, the character will later be uh, be identified as um, uh, crewman Leslie. I think is mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is what they, how they refer to him. Um, mm -hmm. So we, that's the opening shot, and we have um, a voiceover from Kirk. They they're they're beaming down to this planet, which where there's a husband and wife who are archaeologists uh, on a. They're the only people on this dig on this uh, planet with no people left, but only the ruins of an ancient civilization. And they have to, as part of Starfleet regulations, uh, the they have to receive a visit from us from a ship and get medical exams from the doctor. You know, that's every year, every year. And the the twist is that the the wife of this couple um, is an old flame of Doctor McCoy, which and is nice, nice character development. I wish we got more background on characters other than Kirk. In the original series, yes, yes, mm -hmm. th that's true. We do get some in some of the movies and and some of the other stuff, but not in the original series. Um, and uh, what I and we we learn we learn McCoy's secret nickname, Plum. Plum, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I'd keep that a secret too. Um, <laughs> so what I what I, I, think... I, I have a, I have a friend who whose whose nickname for his wife was Puddin. <laughs> well, and he, he'd use that in public. That, but that's at least I've heard that before, but they, I've never heard someone called Plum. Uh, I thought it was funny that Kirk would include Nancy Crater's past relationship with McCoy in the ship's log, which is an official record. Yeah. You know, I thought that was quite funny. I mean, I can see her in a personal log, but uh, there's uh, a lot that gets included in Kirk's. <laughs> They, Kirk's yeah, exactly. Ships logs. They they must have made very interesting reading back at Starfleet headquarters. You know, yeah. but the, the idea the, the idea of the ship's log is is I think kind of a brilliant one for the series, right? Because it gives you a way to do exposition mm -hmm. very concisely, very quickly, and yet it fits in with the the plot of the series, right? This idea that the captain has this log that he needs to fill out as part of his daily routine. So it, it really was kind of a brilliant idea that, of course, has continued throughout all of Star Trek, where you've got this log uh, device that they yes. can use. Although literary in, device. Yeah. And this one, they use it a lot. I think they 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 kind of pull back on that. I mean, there's like four or five times where he does the voiceover in this one. Mm -hmm. I think they pull back on that a little bit uh, as we go on in the series. Uh, I I do like that he uh, when they're down on the on the planet, uh, Kirk starts mocking McCoy on the about him being nervous to see her again about bringing flowers to her as he pulls up some like weeds, weeds, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and but McCoy Dead weeds, yeah, McCoy gives it as well as much as well as he you know he gets it. He he kind of oh so that's how you think you get a girl and. Well, they, they definitely they want to establish a relationship between Kirk and McCoy very early on. I mean, that was pretty clear about that. Yes, that's very it, clear. It's, it's interesting because even though this was the first episode aired, it was not the first episode of the regular series produced. Right. Correct. Um, and they deliberately aired it out of order because the network thought it would be better to have like a planet bound, so not set on the ship mm -hmm. episode that had a monster and that wasn't too cerebral and stuff. But it served, it functioned so well as an introduction because we have all these character moments. I mean, we have the, like you just mentioned the um, Kirk McCoy character moment. And later we have this wonderful Spock Uhura scene. Oh, yes. Where, yeah. you know, uh, she you know, she's talking about if I hear the word frequency once more, I'll scream. And he says, well, that would be very illogical for a communications officer. And so yeah. we've just learned she's the communications officer. He's Mr. Super Logical. She, she starts talking about, you know, tell me about Vulcan's moon. And and he says, well, Vulcan <laughs> well, has no moon. And she says, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and and we, yeah. we just she learned flirts. so much about. Yeah, she, she flirts with him outrageously. She tells him to tell to tell her that she's beautiful. And you can yeah. see how uncomfortable he feels <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> and we just learned so much about these characters through that interaction. It is an awesome introduction to them. 
far better than what we get in Encounter at Farpoint. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. We we also get when they learn someone on the planet has died, um, and Mr. Spock just basically says, thank you, so noted, or whatever. Uhura is shocked as, at his insensitivity to death and says, you know, it could be the captain, and he's the closest thing you have to a friend. Yeah. And it just we just have their the basic forecast relationships laid out for us right there in this right. intro, in this story that wasn't even meant to be an introduction. Right. In fact, it was the sixth episode produced of the of the of the original series. Uh, so th what I find interesting is, is that this this repartee, this flirting with between you, well, you were flirting with Spock. I'm not sure there's much going mm -hmm. in the other direction. Um was almost was sort of the basis. She's not so much flirting with him as flirting at him. You're right. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of is the basis for what we see in the uh, the Kelvin reboot, the uh, the, the, the G. G. Oh. Abrams movie, yeah, which I was, is I was thinking point. the same thing. Yeah, that actual relationship between Uhura and Spock, which is kind of a fun thing to see. Uh, this is it, that it goes right back to the very beginning. This is more fun though. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, you know, you can't beat Michelle I, I do Nichols. like those Spock, <laughs> as, as she's flirting with him, he actually does the collar, you know, where he's kind of adjusting his collar as she's talking. Is know? it warm in here, or is it just me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so back back on the planet, uh, they the Kirk and uh, McCoy and uh, Ensign Dead is, a, or Crewman Dead. Uh, <laughs> Not wearing a red shirt yet. Not wearing a red shirt yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was it was the dead man walking is uh, is his name. No, Darnell is the one in the first Darnell. one to die, and um, mm. he they all oh, yeah. go into the uh, the apparently the ruins where that they've made uh, that Doctor uh, Crater and, and Crater. Mrs. Crater have turned into their home. Uh, they're not there yet, and then she walks in, and everyone sees her as what they expect, or in some cases would would love to see. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, McCoy sees her as she, he remembers her from, I think, 10 years ago, the last yes, time he saw so her. Star Trek Discovery time. We could see Nancy Crater in an upcoming uh, episode, only not oh, the vampire go. version. Yeah, or and McCoy. That would be nice. That would be kind of fun to see. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they would bring in um, the guy from Kelvin timeline. That would be fun. Uh, so they uh, th then Kirk sees her as uh, you know, a woman of Older her age. Nancy Crater. Yep. And then Crewman Darnell sees her as the chick he hooked up with at the uh, Wrigley's Pleasure Planet <laughs> on his last vacation. Uh, Mike, it, okay. sounds, it sounds like a low budget Risa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one one thing I, I kind of noted. Those this this seemed kind of an inconsistency in the episode because this first scene they each see a different woman, but from that point on, everybody sees the same person that this shapeshifter has changed into. I. I kind of took that as the shapeshifter figured out that it's a bad idea to look different to different people. Cause this, this was the first time that they've had, that it's had multiple people, people looking at it. Looking at it. Mm, yeah. It, it also is drawing on the memories of the people around it for its appearance. That's one of the reasons it zeroes in on McCoy late in the episode uh, it even says so uh, yep. he, he, it says, cause talking about, uh, Dr. Crater, Robert Crater, her husband, yep. she said, the monster says, I don't relate to them, meaning other people as well as you. You have such strong memories of me. I like your feelings better, much stronger. Right. So mm -hmm. apparently he feels strong, stronger about her than most people. And that's helping her with her disguise and yeah, right. goals well, generally. It's apparently not just a, a vampire of salt, but a vampire of love. It's a salt and love vampire. <laughs> yeah. Because it feeds off of strong emotion <laughs> as much as the salt. Now, that would have been a great title, The Salt and Love Vampire. Also, I think you can explain the difference uh, in the appearances another way. Because initially, in that first scene, the only person who knows Nancy Crater is McCoy. Mm -hmm. And the others apparently have not seen a picture of her. And so their imaginations are going to fill in what they expect her to look like. But whereas his memories are going to tell him. And in the same way later, when he's when the vampire is impersonating, say, Crewman Green or sure. or whoever, everybody knows Crewman Green. So he looks like they expect Crewman Green to look like because right. their memories fill that in. Although apparently it creates a, a, a figure 
wholesale out of, right. out of some memory for Uhura of this, this sexy night. African man. Yes, the who yeah. speaks Swahili, which was a lot of fun to see. In a, it in was a really good scene. I love yeah, that scene. That was good. Yep. Um, so, uh, crewman Darnell uh, is sent out to go find, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Crater. Uh, Mrs. Crater, and he does dum dum dum. <laughs> well, it's yeah. I mean, well, no, he's he uh, he's actually sent, I'm sorry, Kumar Darnell is sent to go stand outside because uh, right, he's he, insulted her. Yes, by telling her you look like the girl from the Pleasure Planet. And then Mrs. Crater is going to find the doc to find her husband, and he chases after. Her. Like, what is he doing by chasing after her? Like, does he think he's been <laughs> invited to something? Like, it was a very strange moment here. What's what's going on here, Crewman Darnell? Well, there's the whole flirting there too between the yeah. the the Pleasure Girl and the Crewman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she gives him a little lilt, uh, you know, the uh, you know the 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 walk and the whatever, you know, whatever you see there, and it it's like okay, uh, I'm not sure what you're doing there, buddy, but uh, that's a bad idea. Even if she were the real uh, deal, uh, <laughs> I, I like how they have Nancy Crater's voice coming out of the mouth of the Pleasure Planet woman. Yes, yes, they did. Uh, they 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 synced that up actually pretty good, given the technology at the time. Uh, Doctor Crater comes back in the meanwhile. He's belligerent, combative. Um, and then once he realizes they've seen Nancy, he's suddenly polite and welcoming. Uh, so obviously, right. you know, he doesn't want them there to discover the truth. Um, but you know, uh, the, he seems like kind of a jerk. I just going to come right and say, yeah. It. <laughs> so, so here's, here's one of my problems with the writing in the episode. Um, it, Crater, both. Robert Crater and Salt Vampire Nancy Crater are like super adamant, obsessive, stay away. It's like you're just going to attract attention by taking this attitude. Mm -hmm. And they're both super obsessed about Salt. Right. Which which the other characters notice. And um, and I'm going, why? OK. He says later he doesn't remember whether it was a year or two that the vampire killed the real Nancy Crater. Well, if the if as we're told, you they have a starship come by every year to run physicals on them, it had to mm -hmm. either be within the last year or there's a way to pass the medical tests and fool them into thinking you're not a salt vampire. So either right. they have a way to fool the medical tests, in which case they should just chill out and not worry about them. Or they don't have a way to pass the medical test, in which they, case they should still chill out and try to find a way to fool them. And they don't do either of those things. They get yeah. super defensive, super secretive. That's just going to attract more attention. And or it was it, less than a year, less than a year ago. Before, well, that's that's what yeah. I, that's what I mean. In which yeah. case they should still chill out and try to find a way to fool the test. Yeah. But it also, if it's less than a year, that even makes it more super creepy than it is. <laughs> because this guy has, I mean, if a salt vampire killed my wife, I would not be getting romantically involved with the salt vampire. I'm <laughs> right. sorry, that is exactly. not happening. I would be killing the salt vampire, and I wouldn't care if it's the last of its species. Although Kirk kind of calls him on that, doesn't he? Like at the, in the in the briefing room, um, yeah. you know, your own private whatever like he kind of he really like alludes so, to yeah. it is really creepy yeah. yeah and especially creepy if it's been less than a year since the real nancy died yeah um so that's just super creepy the best i can do in terms of head cannon is this thing is telepathic and it's doing some kind of telepathic thing on him well we do know that it has the ability like like classical human people. yeah human yeah. vampires it hypnotizes affects your uh, perceptions so there's Possibly, you know, we could headcanon some of that. Um, we do get, uh, we get, so Kermit Darnell is dead man walking. He's he's dead. Um, and we get our very first ever, he's dead, Jim. And that will be the first of many uh, mm -hmm. with from Dr. McCoy. And uh, I, I like the fact that the, the uh, Nancy, we'll just call it Nancy, uh, tries, to, tries to hide the fact that, you know, what actually killed him by making it seem like he ate the poisonous plant. <clears throat> this is whole Borgia plant. What a great name. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. For, for people who may not know, the Borgias were a famous Italian political family who were up to no good in the like the 50s. Including some of the uh, worst uh, popes. popes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. some of the evil popes. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, 
they 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 need to find out what happened to him, what really happened, and uh, when they get they take him back up to the ship. They, we have this moment where Uhura is mad at uh, Spock, and then we get this great scene in the in sick bay, uh, which they call the dispensary at first, but eventually we get the, yep. the proper name sick bay uh, later on in, in the uh, series, um, where Kirk is ticked at McCoy. He gets mad because because mm-hmm. McCoy is still like booning about nancy and oh yeah and and he's like i'm not interested in playing the funny you know uh game of you know making fun of you for your old flame showing up anymore because i lost a crewman and i'm mad right. about it um yeah. but the, well rather say but then they resolve it quickly like there it doesn't drag out they mm-hmm. mccoy apologizes kirk kind of accepts the apology and apologizes too there's a lack of this of ongoing drama, just turning this into a dramatic thing. I like that. It was really right. good. Mm-hmm. I like the freaky skin modeling all over uh, the crewman's face. Yes. It's like, right. wow, very simple. Like they used lipstick or something on his face and it totally looked like he had been salt kissed to death. <laughs> yeah. Something yeah. was going on. Yeah. I, I mean, the, it, it would have been interesting if they'd found like salt deposits or, you know, something yeah, on the edges. But this is. This is where the science gets wonky because we've got like um, we we have like 60. We've got 300. An ordinary 160 pound person has 300 grams of salt in his in his body. So that's like one and a half cups of salt. And um, and it's scattered all throughout our body. Mm-hmm. There is no way you could suck it out through somebody's face. That makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's still cool to, to look at and imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yes, and they, they apparently so the the idea is that it's a very hot, very dry planet that where you have to you know regularly um, replenish your salt that you've sweated out. Right. Well, you're gonna yeah, yeah you're gonna you're gonna drink water because this is before Gatorade. This is before a lot of the you know the, <laughs> yeah. the sports drinks we have now. So I mean that was normal procedure. You would drink right. water, but you need to replenish salt. Yeah. Well, of and, course, and you... salt salt tablets are a real thing. They would right. they would have industrial workers, you know, take them and stuff for just this purpose. Mm-hmm. And I I had an experience sort of like this once. I went to World Youth Day in 1993, mm-hmm. and I had to I had to work outdoors all day handing out booklets, and right. I drank like two gallons of water that day. It was so hot. I mean, it was. It, I'm mm-hmm. not exaggerating. Mm-hmm. It was two gallons, and I did not have to go to the bathroom once. That's yeah. how much I was yes. just sweating all day. So you really do need to replenish these things. But of course, uh, we know now that uh, we need to replenish more than just the sodium chloride, but all kinds of yeah. bodily. Uh, and, and, that is, and that is why the sports drinks exist now, because, right. you know, you, you can actually uh, drink all the water you need and still have real serious medical issues if you right. lose your other electrolytes and all that other kind of stuff. Potassium so. and calcium and so forth. Exactly. Now, so here's the thing. This planet is uh, used to have loads and loads of salt vampires living on it. And what were they living on? <laughs> what were they living on? Yeah, presumably not each other. Um, they must have had other things that they would eat the salt from. But but wait, there's no salt on this planet? Come on. When the salt vampires all died, their bodies would have decomposed. The salt would have gone back into the ecosystem there should be tons of salt on this planet. You don't need to be importing it. Well, maybe well, the creature's yeah. been living on it. Well, but yeah, but there should be an, <laughs> if you're the last one, there should be an <laughs> endless supply of salt all just for you. Maybe there's a particular kind of salt they need. And once they consume it, it can't be reconsumed. It can't be recycled. Well, well, maybe it's breaking know, down the salt into have, sodium and chloride. Hmm. Well, maybe, yeah. but but how how does this ecosystem work? You know, how would a creature evolve to need sodium chloride if the ecosystem wasn't combining them? Right. I think did they make a reference to them like destroying their planet, like the little uh, you know ecologically destroying their planet? I don't know if they did. I don't don't think so. Yeah, I, I think it was no, just, just... Used, they used to be like the buffalo, and now there's this one. Yeah, I mean, but the something killed the buffalo, like some external force. That's yeah, uh, that's the difference, right? Exactly, yeah. and and maybe that maybe there, there was a combination of of war or you know some kind of weapon that neutralized the salt. I don't know. <laughs> the salt also, neutralizer. Just how much salt this thing needs. I mean, it kills contrary to its own interests. It yeah. kills 
three crew people down on the planet, it's constantly getting twitchy in the presence of salt. It can barely restrain itself from grabbing the salt shaker and sucking it dry. Um, it kills another crewman on the ship. It kills Crater himself. Yep. It tries to kill Kirk, and it, it, it's just super salt obsessed. How much salt? Right. If, so if this how, thing needed this much salt, it would have gone through that 25 pounds they had in about a week. Right, right, exactly. I mean, there was, that's like six times 300 grams. That's, I mean, that's quite, that's a lot of salt. Yeah. It's a lot of salt. I, the only thing I can headcanon is maybe it has this feast or famine biological cycle where it's mm. like, kind of like a bear getting ready to hibernate. It's got to stock up and then it doesn't right. need to for a long time. I mean, if it's still been living on this planet since the the civilization collapsed as the last one, maybe maybe that's what it does. Yeah, it absorbs as much as it can in the presence of it and then can go without it for a long period of time when there's not any. Maybe. Mm. Um, so we have, a, <laughs> yeah, maybe, who, who knows? It's uh, fun to think about. Uh, we have Janice Rand delivering lunch to Sulu, uh, the y yeoman, who gets hostile work environment from these oh, crewmen boy. in the corridor. Oh, boy. Those guys should have got slapped with a, a lawsuit or demotion or something. And <laughs> Rand is the one character who's not well introduced in this episode because the yeah. crewmen say, how would you like to have her for your own personal yeoman? And then we, the only thing we see her do is deliver lunch to Sulu. And mm -hmm. to my mind, delivering lunch is not part of a yeoman's duties, as far as I'm aware, although I could be wrong about that. But but she's Kirk's personal yes. yeoman. Right. And somebody else brings lunch to Kirk. And so there's, right. if you don't know anything else about her, this doesn't make any sense. I, I did notice there's a whole lot of um, eating, drinking, normal, like everyday activity mm -hmm. going on. Uh, right. Yeah, that that's they, good. They try to show, which, although, uh, yeah. Although food, food in the 23rd century on starships Ooh. looks yeah. really unappetizing. <laughs> well, well, I like the red celery. I mean, it's clear. Yeah, that was about the only part that looked, you know, somewhat appetizing. The little square, crunchy cubes that they were popping in like popcorn really I did not look that, that was, interesting. I, I thought that was like cantaloupe and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a celery in a fruit yeah. plate. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> yeah, no, I think, well, in the mid sixties was, a, was during the time when the idea of science would engineer better food for us was all the yeah. rage. And the idea that foods were starting to become available and things right, like that. So right. yeah. healthy food was processed food. I mean, really, that was the thinking. Yeah. Uh, we've since come around from that. Swanson's TV dinner. Okay. Small tangent, the red celery <laughs> red. I listened to a podcast all about celery recently from America's T test kitchen. Really? Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised. In fact, celery used to come in all kinds of colors and shapes uh, mm -hmm. spiral celery, and it was considered high-class food. At one point mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 20th century, it was more expensive than um, fish eggs. Uh, caviar. Oh. Mm -hmm. so, so, cool. Well, that's you, funny. You, okay, so another parallel <laughs> development like that? Yes. Aluminum originally uh -huh. was extremely rare because it combines so well with other elements. You almost never find elemental aluminum. Mm. And so it was it was super expensive. It was more expensive than gold and platinum. Wow. And so rich people would have their aluminum spoons and forks and knives for the <laughs> really special occasions. <laughs> they leave the gold stuff in the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, back from the tangent, we could, we could, I think uh, Jimmy can out tangent me uh, on on stuff. So Sulu is still working in the botany lab at this point. Uh, Sulu is not yet helmsman, or or maybe he's off duty, and this is his hobby. Right. Uh, really nice botany lab. I wish we got to yeah. see more of this. Yeah, we never did. In fact, uh, and I gotta say, I kind of like the uh, practical effect of Beauregard, the plant. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Which, guy, so, how'd you like me, the crewman though, that had to be underneath the table? With yeah, that with the hand, hand puppet. That. Yeah. <laughs> that I, was a lot I of know. fun. I, Beauregard is so much fun. It looks totally cheesy, but it looks okay for the time and the budget. And I, I, I had fun with Beauregard. I think that's it, that's cool. There's a very funny line where uh, Sulu says to uh, uh, Ran Janice Rand, uh, in, "And thanks for bringing him lunch. May the great bird of the galaxy bless your planet." Uh, well, Star Trek fans know that that was actually a, a nickname for Gene Roddenberry was the great bird of the galaxy. Uh, right. I, I haven't seen where exactly it came from, but... I, I think this may be the origin of it. 
I oh, think okay. that this, my guess is this line came first and then it got applied to Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and then it there enters are, canon. There are other really weird lines in here, some of which are not very effective, even though the food eating and stuff that, and getting lunch arrangements done, and that's all very normal. But then we have the 1960s cheesy space dialogue, like, why don't you go chase an asteroid? And suppo- <laughs> I like that. I kind of laughed and, about that one. And, but... and suppose he's going space happy or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's the future. You everyone's in space. You don't have like it's that old classic. Uh, you don't have to make everything space language because just because oh. you're in space. I admittedly I like the asteroid one because it, that that kind of implies go jump out an airlock and chase an asteroid or go <laughs> jump in a lake. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um. Uh, so later on, I mean, there's lots of chasing around through quarters. Uh, the, the the salt vampire has got on but, board. By, by the way, notice the datedness even of go jump in a lake. Yeah, I know yeah. to me and Dom and probably Father Corey, it sounds fairly normal, but it also sounds like something from our childhoods. Mm-hmm. We would not say that today. That's true. Yeah, that slang and jargon does uh, age very quickly. I, um, I still yeah. use the take a long, long walk off a short pier. I do oh, still use that one. An, another <laughs> classic. Today, today, people would just go straight for the F word. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right. It's a less subtle time. Uh, so uh, there's lots of so there's uh, lots of chasing the vampire around on the ship and it trying to, um, to, to unsuccessfully attack people. Uh, it gets one guy in, in the uh, engineering suit. Um, but otherwise that uh, tries to get you horror does is not uh, uh, uh successful um we get to uh the crater is still on the planet and they're still trying to scan the planet looking for nancy crater uh i, I like the fact that when kirk is trying to get mccoy to sober up metaphorically speaking he tells him we need to go back up to the ship where we have equipment that could pinpoint a match on the surface of this planet. And right. That's, that's actually, you know, quite believable for, I mean, given the resolution orbital sensors have now, that's quite yes. believable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, although he tells Spock to break up the scanning equipment because it's not just part of the, the as, as if Standards, you have to, uh, you know, take yeah. out some equipment and set it up. Um, th- there was a moment where uh, they, they captured uh, Dr. Crater. Uh, there was this really neat maneuver where Kirk, and Spock sort of outmaneuver uh, Crater, uh, you know, and Sp- outflank kind him. of flank outflank. him a little bit, yeah. And then uh, Kirk stuns him with this very weird stun effect. We never see it again. Um, mm-hmm. This it has this weird sound and this effect where it like Crater talks slow and drunk for a moment before he snaps out of it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the voice slows down. A very a very odd effect. I'm glad they got uh, rid of that. Um, it, it, so they've got crater on board the creature. So the creature has convinced McCoy to take a sleeping pill because he hasn't been sleeping, uh, through all of this. And, and Kirk had told him to to take a pill and, mm-hmm. uh, which he happened to have sitting on his, uh, desk. And she convinces McCoy to take <laughs> the a, pill. He's a doctor. He's got pills everywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, it looks like Tic Tacs. And, uh, the, the 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 creature assumes McCoy's shape, um, and they have this neat effect from the inside of McCoy's quarters, where they pan from him laying on the de- on the bed across the wall, a very a blank portion of the wall, which they can then cut and then pan yep. over and see McCoy standing by the door, which is uh, fun. Um, we have the the scene in the briefing room where everybody's giving their reports, and McCoy as the the salt vampire uh, as McCoy is distracted. Crater is there. Crater recognizes her. He, he's yeah. He, he for somehow he knows, I, you know, who knows. And, and Kirk figures out that yeah. he can recognize the vampire no matter what form it's in. Uh, I like Kirk's insult. You bleed too much, Crater. You're too pure and noble as he, as he uh, <laughs> then launches into. He, he's, it's like, is he serious? And then he seems to indicate, no, that was all just sarcasm. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, as he gets, you've created your own private heaven. Uh, and so he tells McCoy to break out the truth serum, uh, which, again, in the 60s was a thing that uh, was sort of a yeah. s- semi-futuristic. Uh, Today, we just go straight to the MRIs. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sodium pentothal is 
sort of a thing now, but not really all that effective. Not not for truth purposes. Exactly. Um, we get uh, eventually the creature attacks Kirk, and so we've set up the situation where Kirk is in the a- quarters after after it has killed Robert Crater. Right, right. So this yep. thing totally turns on Crater, and it's ambiguous, or it seemed to me it was ambiguous. Is it because it's so starving, or has it realized that Crater's a threat to it now, and so it calculatingly kills him to eliminate the threat? I felt like it was, like, Crater now was, it knows it can, since Crater can identify him, uh, Crater's a threat. McCoy is the better option, because she says, you've got stronger emotions, you're a better deal. Right, right. Um, so 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 how how evil and creepy is this vampire? I mean, this is mm. this is a really manipulative thing that has no loyalty to this guy that's been exactly. taking care of it. Well, this is the point of survival. Long. This is point of survival of the fittest, and it's going to be the one that survives. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing is creepy. You, the him being yeah. creepy with her, she's being creepy with him. Um, I, I love the <laughs> bit where Kirk is like baiting it with the salt shaker. And it can, yeah. Leonard, make him stop. It's, it's so <laughs> ridiculous. And and then when when it started to suck the salt out of Kirk and Spock rushes in and he's like, good, Nancy, take this. And he's smacking her around and she's just standing there like all this Vulcan strength is nothing to her. And it looks big, so big ridiculous. grin on her it, face. Yeah. yeah. And she Someone throws needs, him across the room. <laughs> Someone needs to do a super cut of just that for like an hour or something. Oh, well, yeah, we need a, we need a gif of, uh, of, uh, of Spock just whacking a racket front yeah. like that. Um, I, also Kirk screams when she's sucking the salt out of him. Presumably no one else did because right. if they mm-hmm. had, they would have been we discovered. Heard. Uh, so, uh, so McCoy, uh, you know, it wrestles, had wrestled with Kirk and ended up with the phaser's hand. So, so McCoy obviously has to be the one who has to make the decision to shoot her and kill her. Uh, and and it, he does. And he does. Well, I mean, certainly once you see her true form, uh, which is kind of creepy. <clears throat> when yeah. I was a kid and saw this, yeah, that one, that one stuck with me. <laughs> I, I, thought it, I thought it was a good alien. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, it's oh, yeah. the practical costume effects from the 60s, so it's not, you know, super yeah. great. But it for the time, I thought it was quite good. Oh, yeah. When I was a kid, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if this salt vampire has a death wish because mm. it is so acting contrary to its own interests throughout it, this whole episode it just wants to end it, it all it's constantly making mistakes yeah and then at the end it shows its true form to dr mccoy it's like it flashes him with the fact i'm not really nancy look at how horrible i am and that's what tips him over the edge to kill it um so i kind of wonder if this thing has a death wish mm. And I, I, interesting, uh, you know, I like McCoy right before he shoots says, Lord, forgive me uh, mm-hmm. as he shoots. I mean, this is a time when, you know, uh, when people yeah. would still ha- voice uh, religious sentiment, you know, back in the 60s uh, would still be part of who they are uh, on in, television. In, in television. And so he, he seeks forgiveness for what he's about to do because he's conflicted um, because mm-hmm. he's confused, I think, is part of it. Um and then when we get to the end, uh, Kirk is on, on you know, in his in the center seat. They're ready to go. The helmsman, you know, hey, Captain, we're ready to go to, to leave orbit. Um, and Kirk is distracted. And uh, Spock says, "You know, Captain, we're ready." And says, uh, "I was, I was just thinking about the buffalo." He says to him, "You know, recalling that conversation." Mm-hmm. Um, and I like this because there's, there's no long rambling diatribe about extinction or the grand meaning of it all or some Voyager esque mm-hmm. moment where they're all standing around consoles chatting about their, you know, their superior solution to whatever. It's just sort of <laughs> the audience is expected to take the take yeah. the lesson from this that they get. And notice, even though this is the first episode broadcast, we have a sad ending. Yeah, we don't mm-hmm. have the typical thing of. You know the threesome having enjoying a laugh to the clarinet of humor at right, the end of right. the episode. Yes, this is true. The, the clarinet of humor. That's a good. That's a good way of putting it. I, I can hear that now. Um, so, uh, any? Do you guys have any other notes on this? Those are my notes. Uh, Jimmy, do you have anything more you want to say about it? Just two little short things. I thought Crewman Green was very effective once the salt vampire replaced him. He was mm-hmm. really creepy. Um, mm-hmm. And I also. 
uh, liked after Spock got assaulted the first time, um, we get to see that he's got this green bruising right. and stuff. Right. And he says, my ancestors were spawned in a very, in a different ocean. So my blood is very different from yours. And so we're starting to get some of the alienness of Spock that makes him, you know, uh, have this green blood and stuff like that. And that's, that's cool. Uh, also makes it totally implausible. His dad could breed with a human, but it's cool. <laughs> Another story. Yeah. Uh, Father Corey, do you have anything more? Uh, uh just got a couple small things as well. Um, first of all, you know, they, they like to reuse props. Uh, Crater's weapon was from the cage, was the, the phasers they used in the cage. That's right. So they like to reuse. And I think that's the second time we've seen it. I think they, they showed those again where no man has gone before. I think yep. they showed up in there as well. And then um, just I just kind of laughed where, you know, there's Sulu and Rand finds the dead crewman and Sulu immediately runs over and touches the spots <laughs> as if he couldn't be con possibly contagious with something that sulu now has because he just yeah. touched the spots uh, yeah where he's that contagious could, that could be as deadly as touching a pating for all he knows <laughs> exactly oh there's an old reference from a few months back uh, yeah. so uh <clears throat> so he, he, maybe he's trying to see if it rubs off um so what one of the other things i didn't i didn't mention was uh this this moment where they get this call from the star base on corinth four from uh base commander jose dominguez who desperately needs his chili peppers mm -hmm, and yeah. kirk says they're prime mexican reds i handpicked them myself and you won't die if you go for more a few more days without that i'm like wow that's <laughs> just it's just a uh, uh, something from its time. Just, just put it that yeah. way. <laughs> what, what I what I want to know is is this Starbase uh, first Corinth four or Starbase second Corinth four? <laughs> oh, so, well, we've read a letter to them and we'll we'll know. Uh, we'll find so out. Yeah, we'll find out. So, uh, all right. So that's the man trap. Uh, we have a little bit of feedback from previous episodes mm. on, uh, or we have one one piece of feedback this week uh, f from our episode on where no man has gone before. Uh, uh, Alfredo Burundas uh, tells us on Facebook uh, something you may have said and I missed no uh, we we did not say this but uh, thanks for catching the actor playing Lieutenant Mitchell Gary Lockwood also played Dr. Poole in 2001 A Space Odyssey a, mm -hmm. not, he's yep. not very lucky in space <laughs> I'm Early sorry not. Dave uh, you're dead again <laughs> so uh, <laughs> thank you Alfredo that was, uh, that was a good catch on that one so that's it from us. Uh, what did you think of the man trap? Uh, do you, was this an episode you enjoyed? What do you think of what we had to say about it? Let us know by going to sqpn.com slash Trek, find this week's episode and leave a comment there or go to the SQPN Facebook page and leave us a comment on the episode there. Uh, you can send an email to Trek at sqpn.com. You can find links relevant to our discussion on our show notes on sqpn.com. Um, and remember, our giving campaign is coming to a close. We need your help now. Uh, this is a very urgent call. So if you yeah. can go to go to sqpn.com slash give and become uh, a patron and help us continue our mission, uh, five-year mission to bring you these <laughs> great uh, shows that you're enjoying and that are reaching a lot of folks. So help us continue that by going to sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Yeah, glad to be here, and thank you, Dom. Uh, Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, I don't like mysteries. They give me a bellyache, and I got a beauty right now. This is Dom Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com give.